here in Mosley. Let me introduce you to our moderator. This is Vinay Gupta. Hi, Vinay. Away we go. No, I'm sorry. I totally forgot. Where's Tessa? Tessa, get down here. I was looking for Alex. We are here at the tech space, this gorgeous venue, by the way. Thank you so much. Please come up here and give us a quick word about the space. I know this is the last thing you want to hear right now. Um, Welcome walking space, PLDR, flexible walk space, hot desks, event spaces, all of all of that. Um, but yeah, if you ever want to come test out one of our hot desks or something, come speak to me. I'm more than happy to hook you guys up. And I hope you guys enjoy this. And if we have any tech space members, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you, Tessa. Sorry about that. Okay, Vinay, over to you. Okay, great. Um, so this is going to be a very, very interesting panel. Uh, we have an enormous diversity of perspectives and capabilities on uh, this whole kind of space for a lot of assets to centralize physical infrastructure. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the panelists off by having them introduce themselves, uh, and then give us a very quick one minute on what RWAs and UK mean to them. Uh, either one. Um, so, an introduction and what part of this space you're working on, and uh, you can start in any order. Thank you, great to be here, and uh, hello everybody. So, Adam Feiler, and I'm Head of Partnerships at Minima. Minima Global is a layer one blockchain protocol that runs in full on mobile or IoT devices. So, we are a uh, what we call transactional proof of work consensus, where every device is a full validation constructive node. We remove the need for miners and validators. We all contribute the work to build the chain. The minimum is an ultra compact blockchain that basically fits on um, the device at the edge. So our role, we feel, is true data attestation or communication between devices. So we uh, fit squarely in the deep in infrastructure support uh, network. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. What's up, everybody? Uh, I'm Francesco. I'm part of the DevRel team at Consistis. How many of you know Consistis? Okay, a couple of people. But uh, yeah, for the for the new people here, uh, there is a tool called uh, MetaMask. It's a wallet that you can use. Uh, you maybe use uh, or you deploy how many developers do we have in the room so that we know how to tune up the discussion. Okay, yeah, some some people. But basically, like uh, if you build a app, you can deploy on a layer two. Uh, we have uh, something called Linear. And bunch of like DP infrastructures are currently um, uh, deploying it, and uh, yeah, a bunch of the like developer tooling. But we're trying to be, uh, you know, the co leader in the space and bringing different narratives like the DP and the different cool topics uh, to uh, to be debated. And uh, uh, yeah, and uh, we're super excited to be here today. Hey everyone, I'm Katie. Um, I'm from Outlier Ventures. I'm our RWA accelerator. Um, Outlier Ventures has, is an early stage investor um, in early stage startups. We run accelerator programs across various different verticals of Web3. Um, the ones that we currently have going on are RWA, DPIN, and AI and crypto, so pretty on topic for today. Um, and uh, I can, I'm going to be speaking, I guess, about our RWA things today, so happy to be here. Hello everyone, I'm, I'm Pete, I'm one of the co-founders of Kudos. Um, down as the VP of Corporate Development, which sounds really wanky, so apologies for that, I'm going to get that title change on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, we are a layer one blockchain, uh, but we're not focused uh, in a typical way a layer one is on building dApps or having dApps still on us. Uh, we're all about scalable computes uh, at the core, so uh, a lot of focus around the kind of AI buzz. Um, uh, it's a real thing, there's a lot of infrastructure that's required behind. Uh, we wanted to make sure that that was available for the Web3 world as well. So, um, yeah, really interesting conversation. Great to see so many new faces there, by the way. We're just making that comment at the beginning. Um, but yeah, RWA and DPIN, two terms that weren't even, didn't have a nickname 18 months ago, and now everyone's talking about them. So let's demystify that for me. Yeah, I remember when there was this question about what is it all going to be called? And, um, you know, the other thing which I thought was, in many ways, a better name is your work with was DOT, digitally owned things. And I kind of feel like that's quite an interesting um, place to start because when some people say RWA, what they really mean is things like tokenized treasury bills, real asset, it's an actual asset. But other people say RWA is things like a vaulted artwork. 
So that in itself then creates quite a bit of you know kind of interesting complexity in terms of understanding the terminology. What I'd like to do now is go around quickly and get everybody's sort of thoughts on what kinds of assets they're really connected to. Right, you know, where where what's your part of this? If everybody's touching their different parts of this large complex thing, what's the particular family you have? Hey, can we start? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, let's start with RWA. So I think this is a really interesting point. Uh, so anyone that's not aware of that, it's a real world asset. They, maybe they should have called it D things or something because most things are D. But anyway, missed the trick there. Um, so this could be like the tokenization of everything. Right? So you know, think of there's something that you know is is not fungible, like a house or a car or some trainers or you know artwork or something. I know Katie's going to speak about art, so I won't take that one. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, we were we built a plan around actually tokenizing renewable energy infrastructure. So think about everyone that's living in a flat in London that can't put solar panels on their roof. Well, what if you could own a token that represented part of the solar panel somewhere in the Sahara Desert, right? Because we all breathe in the same air around the world, uh, and you get the opportunity to earn passively from that token. Uh, and if you didn't want it anymore, you can sell that token on. It has a secondary market. It's fungible in that sense. So, um, you know, all these things can be. I've, I mean, I've got a, a friend at the moment that has been waiting a year to compete on his house, and there's nobody in the chain. But imagine if you took out all of those middle men and middle women, and you know, everything was written onto a token, so the land registry, the deeds, the insurance, etc., and you could just exchange that token, and the house sale goes through from the, from the seller to the buyer. So that's kind of where we're, what we're talking about with, with RWA. There's loads and loads of use cases, and I think we're just really um, you know, at the beginning of that like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, Outlier Ventures, we actually released a thesis um, all around RWA, actually, early this year. And within that, we kind of categorized RWAs into two separate categories. One is physical assets. So that can be things like art, real estate, watches, collectibles, things you can physically pick up and touch, but may not be digitized. Um, and then there's intangible assets. So that can include things like financial instruments, which is a huge aspect of our WA, as we've just said, but it can also be things like IP and data and copyright and things like this. So um, it's a very, very broad <laughs> term that stretches across multiple different industries, and I think that's really interesting. Um, and I think within that, there's broadly kind of two real kind of, let's say, aspects of our WA. One is like digitalization, so uh, I would say tokenized RWA is representing any kind of asset like in a digital format on the blockchain, right? So there are some assets which are already digital, but there are some which are obviously not like art, and it's looking at what's the incremental kind of gain of tokenizing an asset. Um, at Outlier Ventures, what we actually work, have been investing in most is financial assets, this aspect of RWA, but from a personal perspective, um, I'm obviously quite interested in art as a physical asset because I used to come from the art world, I used to work at Christie's Auction House as an auctioneer, so happy to go into detail about that later on. Yeah, well, actually, could you, could you tell us a bit more about it now? So, Chuck, what do you think are the opportunities for the art world in the music world? Like, you know, in the, Christie's is what, 300 years old, 200 years old? Yeah, 17, oh, some 1767 or something so, like that. Yeah. Yeah, America, yeah, a fairly venerable yeah. institution. So, you know, for institutions like that, and you know, much of the art world is institutions of that general nature. So for institutions like that, you know, how does this technology look? And what's in this for the artists who are, after all, living, working artists, so the people that have the most gain are using this? How would this work? What's, what's on the table? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question because, um, well, let me put this into context. I, I joined Christie's in 2012, and at that time, um, we were still cataloging artworks on a DOS screen. <laughs> so um, that kind of shows you how adverse to emerging technology somewhere like the traditional art industry is. But I think what blockchain technology has done is actually opened up a really big opportunity in the art world um, because uh, because of kind of like being able to track assets and being able to uh, build royalties into the sale of assets on the secondary market and be able to keep track of that. 
um, this is something that's very interesting to the art world, as well as other aspects of, you know, um, cataloging artworks and keeping data available in a kind of very immutable fashion. Um, I think in the art world, uh, you know, the kind of the access to provenance, as we call it, so um, how an artwork has uh, gone through hands or changed hands uh, over the this kind of course of its life um, is something that's quite difficult to record, but it's um, something that's actually very valuable to know where that, that artwork has been, and blockchain can facilitate kind of uh, the categorization and the cataloging of these artworks in that way. But also bringing it back to kind of um, artists as individuals, um, blockchain technology can of course be used to build in royalty rights so that if you are um, somebody who has uh, created an artwork from the start, um, you if that's then resold on a secondary market, you're always going to get the value flowing back to you uh, as somebody who deserves it rather than just into rich people's pockets, if you know what I mean. So imagine if Picasso, as they said, um, his family or his relatives had royalties on every single piece of art that was sold for millions and millions, um, that would be an awful lot of money. So. I just want to add that um, one big keyword here is also about uh, democratizing access to those instruments. And, uh, you know, we have been all about democratization and uh, trying to have an active uh, community to contribute also like to specific things. And uh, I don't know if many of you guys heard about MetaMask Naps, but basically like those are add-ons for what your extension does today. So you can add those kind of like functionality to the wallet. But the good thing is that we are not in charge of building those. The community and the developer out there, the startup out there, the organization out there can extend the functionality to the wallet with this kind of like standardized uh, language. And I think this is very powerful because it's not just about democratizing uh, access to those features, but it's also enabling the community to build and further uh, activate the features that they want. So for example, in the fine art context, you have hundreds of years of provenance, you've got all the documents, you've got recordings of the instrument being played, you've got pictures of work being painted, all that stuff gets folded into the wallet functionality so that if it's a fine art NFT, all the provenance stuff is displayed in some kind of nice way. This kind of thing? Yeah, so I mean, on your kind of touching on UX, so we are still not there, but the idea is that's also a feedback that we got quite a lot is that with the snaps, are we able to extend not just the functionality uh, on the wallet, but also the extending the, the UI and the UX of the wallet? And we were getting there, and this is also like something that we're working quite hard on. But what I'm excited about those days is like functionality like non EVM compatible snaps. So, literally, like with four clicks, you're able to do native BTC transaction, Solana uh, transaction directly on your wallet. And this is one category, you know, non EVM compatible snaps. You have also stuff like, uh, you know, notification snaps, you have like account instruction snaps. You can create live wallets uh, like this. And the good thing is that you're you're able to do also like, you know, account recovery quite easily. So those are, and depends, like we are, we are seeing much more, um, how do you say, a personalized journey. There are NFT heavy uh, users. There are more security heavy users. There are people that want to just interact with DeFi. They don't care about the other use cases. So like personalizing wallets today, is something is extremely important. You know, this seems particularly important in an RWA context because you know if you're looking at something like a, you know an NFT, the NFT is relatively self-contained, but you still need to do bits of extension to the wallet to go talk to IPFS and to come back with the image, this kind of stuff. And when you start talking about fundamentally much more complex assets, at that point it becomes even more important to be able to customize the things displayed to have different kinds of functionality. If we think about physical vaulting. The notion that you could have instructions sent physical wallet through the wallet, all of this kind of customization, and even if it's something like a key bill, you want to be able to tell which one it is. Yeah, large areas. I, I want to just kind of wrap up the question about art. So, in in a kind of art utopia, how does the fine art business change because of this kind of digitization? Like, what's the best possible outcome? And this is a particular pain point for us because like half of material are musicians. Uh, Antoine, who's my managing director, is a staggering rock frontman. Um, you know, the guy that edits our video is a folk musician. We've got two choristers from you know, sort of the, the sort of world. You know, anyway, so this notion of we've watched the music industry basically destroy musicians 
by extracting all of the value into the tax side of it. Clearly, that's the anti pattern. We should never do that to anyone again. We have to go back and fix that. What's the utopian vision for blockchain and finance? Yeah, that, that's a tricky one. I think there's two angles because um, there's access to art in terms of, like, we all know that I think the art world is quite an elitist like, industry, right? So if I want to buy and interact and own art, that's actually quite prohibitive. And then there's the second side of empowering artists. If I go to the first side, um, I think something that tokenized RWA is an, an aspect of that is also fractionalization, right? So um, you, you could take a Picasso and own a fraction of that Picasso and that can all be kind of uh, recorded and done on the blockchain in a way that allows pieces of an artwork to be traded um, and make it more accessible in terms of entry point level, right? But I think this comes back to the question of uh, what are the right kinds of assets that we want to be tokenizing? Because Although in one sense that seems to make it more accessible, I think in another sense, when you look at um, what you're doing, if you're fractionalizing an asset, it's actually almost making it into a financial instrument, right? Which is causing it probably to be a security of some kind, which means that there's not a framework set up for artworks in that kind of world. We don't know what the regulation is. And people who want to own art might not be familiar with those kind of um, regulations and, and frameworks. So in some ways it's actually contradictory. Kind of terra incognita, we don't know where we're going. Yes. Big new space. Exactly. So I'm actually a little bit nervous about that concept. Um, and I'm not sure that that is a utopia. Um, but, but perhaps the, the, the um, road to adoption is via digitally native art, which is already existing in a digital format. Um, I've seen um, uh, like funds around digital art being created where institutional investors are giving money there, but I, I'm, I'm worried about that. I think from the artist's perspective, there's obviously lots that can be done, um, but you need both sides, the buyers and the sellers, and I think it's how do we deal with the buyers to empower the artists, which is a big problem. I think we know how to empower the artists in terms of the structure, but on the buy side, it's more tricky. So everything at the end of the day comes down to the social contract. I hope we have some questions about this at the end because I'd love to go into this in more detail and we've got a lot of time left. But this question of the social contract between the owners of things has been the key point of renegotiation. The best time to renegotiate any social contract in any kind of cultural moment is when the asset is being digitized. When things go from pre-digital to digital, there's a moment of mutability when it becomes possible to renegotiate everything about it. And if you get that right, you get an explosion of new function, new color, new culture. And if you get it wrong, you get the kind of extracted mess we have need. Um, okay, so let's continue with the theme of utopias. Um, what happens in the utopian vision for edge computing on the blockchain? Like, what's the so social and cultural payoff for having this ability to a blockchain type computation happen in you know, every little solar panel and every little column? Absolutely. Okay, so in the context of deep in there, the concept that you decentralize uh, infrastructure and you allow people to get paid for the service they provide, the utopia, what well, people, the reason that deep in has gathered such momentum, I think um, there's two reasons to it. The first is that it's um, an, an, an encompassing ecosystem. So unlike a lot of uh, the competition that is that has spawned blockchain projects up until now, that you're a maxi in one in one protocol and, and therefore you can't adopt another. I think this idea is that um, now suddenly people are realizing that you can use the uh, best parts of protocols to complement each other. So to provide the full user experience and end-to-end -end solution, for example, you might use distributed uh, distributed compute on the edge, you might combine that with a streaming service. You might combine that with a with a file service, and then the full picture is actually um, you know bigger than the sum of the parts. So the utopia, and I think the reason why people are thinking this is good, is because they suddenly think, well, a little bit like the concept of RWA, which is you know we've got a technology that is um, provides uniqueness, it provides immutability, and therefore you can actually assign value to that. So, and, you know, and just as 
long time ago the whole concept of, of Bikram was created as a resistance to the banking system. I think Deepin is, in a way, spawned by people saying, well, you know, uh, we don't need to have big tech controlling everything, all of our lives, all of our information, we want privacy. So it is a combination of keeping um, your own privacy, keeping your own value, but also the idea that actually you can distribute, you can, you can outsource um, computing power or file sharing to a distributed um, collaboration. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this makes a lot of sense. The, um, my first exposure to Deepin was back in the days when it was for solar panels. This is way back in the early time, we're talking 2002, 2003, um, when there was a whole movement to decentralize electricity infrastructure. Uh, I worked in those days at a place called Rocky Mountain Institute, and I worked on a book called Small is Profitable, which was specifically a book about how much more efficient it was to roll out 100 small power stations in one big one. Um, so there are you know, really deep intellectual roots for this stuff. But the problem that always has, everything has always had with this is how do you instrument the edge devices? You know, if we've got 25 solar panels on the roof and we don't own the solar panels, somebody else does, and one of the solar panels malfunctions, it's so much more helpful to be able to know which solar panel and to have all the data stored about what bolt, you know, what, what driver do I need to get those bolts out and what are, you know, all the procedures that were in There's never been a place to store this kind of provenance information for distributed infrastructure. I, I worked on a project called ACRO years and years ago, which was a similar thing for the aid world. And they had a map of like 42,000 wells across East Africa. How much better would it have been if those wells had been flowing home and telling us what's happening? I think the, I think the potential is almost limitless. Yeah. No, I agree. And, and I mean, the concept you mentioned, you know, in the solar panel era, but I think in a SETI in the, in the you know, 2000s was already that concept. You can actually um, distribute your idle compute, but look for you know, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So that, that concept was already um, born, and I think now, as you point out, it has value. So if, some, if a component goes down, you want to know exactly that point at that time. Yeah. And, it, and, and it equally gives a digital um, identity to every, every device. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to come back to a very small, very large in a second. Cool. Well, I just want to say that also like, the big benefit is that you can, you're not just activating the community on building like, small pieces together, but also, like you can attribute uh, uh, challenges or problems uh, on each single uh, place, right? You can see actually where is the latency, what are what are actually the, the, the problems and the challenges for each particular part. You know, like in a bigger system run by one entity, you would never have this possibility. All right. So here, apologies, I'm going to geek out for a second. So in the 2015 uh, Ethereum launch post, I wrote the Microsoft Foundation. Um, I suggested that the, one of the features of blockchain that would be great would be to set up essentially a distributed heterogeneous supercomputer where you could basically have global compute in a single organized place so that when you needed something big done, you would be able to get easily access to the hardware to do that. That sounds familiar. <coughs> okay, I wonder where you're going with that, but yeah. Take it away. Uh, well, first of all, I think you can hear within this space, like Web3 space, the word democratization quite a lot. Um, it's more than a marketing word, you know, it is actually what we're all trying to achieve here. So, um, yes, you know, <laughs> it's exactly that. So, you know, Adam was talking about Minimo and how you can use uh, edge devices to form a compute network. Um, and that is great for a lot of workloads. Minimo is an amazing project and we've been, you know, we've been speaking very closely with the, with the team over there. But there are some workloads that just cannot yet, at this stage, work at the edge. Uh, and that is mainly coming from the kind of AI training. So if you think about the kind of large language models, the chat GBT, uh, some of the other kind of big generative AI services and applications that are being built, you have to build them on extremely expensive machines and kind of give some context. You know, each server is about $350,000 as just the hardware itself. And there are companies out there that are buying 2,000 of these at a time. So they're, they're effectively buying a small village worth of property at a time. So that is not you know, accessible uh, to build out the edge. And it needs to be clustered together, extremely you know, short distances between all the servers for it to actually work efficiently and for them to be able to build it to, to then release those services. So you know, 
how do we then apply the kind of deeper narrative to that? How do we democratize that? Right? So that's, that's, you know, that's the challenge that we wanted to, to, to kind of solve. So um, the answer to that is to create a platform, a marketplace, where you can work with all different service providers around the world. Right? So taking a little bit of, when I say a little bit, it's still a phenomenal map you pick, but it's, you know, you're taking uh, that compute resource from hundreds of different service providers from around the world. So not just solely AWS or Google Cloud or Azure, right? So you are distributing that around the world, giving you those geolocations. And what the marketplace then does is it aggregates all of that. So it federates that compute and represents it as one platform. So from a consumer experience, it's still the same experience but you get the economical benefits, you get the environmental benefits, you get the geographical benefits, uh, and so on and so forth. So effectively what you do is you produce a decentralized distributed hyperscaler, which is what we all want. So the data is not all in one place, it's spread out. So we're achieving you know, that, uh, that distribution, but we're also applying a kind of decentralized type of philosophy um, to it. I mean, you know, the end product of being able to access like supercomputer level run from blockchain type contexts. You know, imagine how that sounds in a world where we're currently, you know, migrating past 30 transactions a second, and we might get to a couple of thousand soon. And all of this work and out and scaling all the rest of it, and then you know, somebody just kind of wheels up a supercomputer computer to the side of that. It's like, you know, you know, how does it's a four teraflop sound? Oh, yeah, it would be bad. Headphones, whatever it is these days. Um, the, you know, that sort of notion that the blockchain is not just a little world computer that is kind of taking over doing little world computer type transactions, but that you can use that compute to organize vast compute. I think that is still very foreign to folks that are used to being very, very constrained when they write blockchain apps of only having rinky in what amounts of compute because everything is being replicated over 20,000 nodes. And then you kind of wheel up the big iron, and it's like, well, you specify the problem over here, and then you push it out onto the big iron, and then you get real compute power. I think paradigmatically, that's always been on the cards as a great future thing, but it's lovely to see that future arriving, because that is age. And, and I think there's a really nice overlap here as well, right? This is where it gets interesting. So we talked about RWAs at the beginning, so real world assets. So, right, now you've got a distributed model and you can apply decentralized physical infrastructure networks that deep in to the core and you can apply it to the edge, right? And that can serve two different types of workloads or hundreds of different types, but, you know, two different categories. So now how do you take that and you apply it RWA to it, right? So how about decentralizing the ownership of that hardware? So as like I said, you know, some of these machines are really expensive, 350,000 a server. What if you fractionalize that and allow people to own, you know, uh, one three hundred and fifty thousand for that, as an example, and then they get the proportionate earnings from that? Not only can you fund a scaling network, but it's democratized and everyone can benefit from that. Uh, and then, you know, the irony is, you know, a lot of this is done for AI, which is going to put a lot of jobs out. So you need to find those ways to, you know, to kind of passively earn going forwards. Uh, anyway, but you know, there's a real big overlap between the two, and uh, and that's you know the beauty of blockchain. Uh, I'll just say on the AI thing very briefly. My personal belief is that we are going to soak up all of the capacity of AI um, by raising standards. You know, you'll rent a house, and it will be a 9400 page contract. And you know, think of what what happened to graphic designers. They got better and better and better tools, and the better their tools got, the busier they got. They don't roll off their feet all the time, and nobody can get a good designer. And that's not because they don't have great tools, it's because the appetite for design rises so rapidly. So I have a feeling that all these lawyers are just like, oh, we've got to point out that they're busier than ever. Because they're probably for money. Yeah, and things evolve, right? So maybe, maybe it, 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 you know, AI is a good replacement for some of the more monotonous jobs to create that efficiency, but things evolve. And if you go into university now, 50% of the courses they're teaching wouldn't have been there five years ago, and that's always evolving. And you get huge creative leverage at the top. So um, I want to broaden this out. Uh, take a look at what's happening in the outside world. Right? So in the last you know, kind of two years, there's been this kind of distant rumbling in the back. And it's gotten a lot closer, a lot closer, a lot closer. And you know, then it broke the surface a little earlier this year when Larry Fink 
went on TV and said, you know, the objective is to tokenize all of the world's financial assets. Tokenize. The most powerful man in finance, nine trillion dollars of assets under management. Saying the word tokenize. Like, wait, that sounds like he's been talking to us. Has he been hanging out with these blockchain people? Well, he does mean to them. So we're now in a position where we've gone from being scrappy rebels on the edge of the solar system running around with our little pod cars and our lightsabers <laughs> to having the evil empire's highest minion say, actually, I think the rebels are probably right and we're definitely going to do that. Um, so, two questions for each of the panelists. And this is a complicated one, so we're, we're going to, I want to keep, I'll keep answers relatively short. Um, so, firstly, BlackRock, good or bad for the space? Right? Is this going to be a good thing seeing these things happen or a bad thing? And then secondly, what do you think is going to change in the sort of perception and culture of blockchain now that all of our core theses are validated? Right? Now that we're no longer outsiders, we're as inside as it gets, we're clearly now the future of finance. What does it mean for us to go from outside to inside? So question one, BlackRock, good for us or bad for us? Number two, what does it mean that we are now the establishment? Ah. <laughs> um, so, I'm going to get this out of the way so that I'm not intimidated by anyone else's answers. But I think um, in balance it's probably good, but with a huge caveat. I think it's quite funny when you think, like, why, why was blockchain created? It's because of people like financial institutions like BlackRock who screwed everyone, right? Um, but when you look at the adoption of RWA tokenized reward assets, um, actually what we need is for um, the supply of these assets to actually be on chain, right? And actually who are the owners of the most amount of assets? It's these massive financial institutions. And from a financial perspective, when you look at assets in the world, I think there's a statistic that 65% of value of all assets are financial assets, right? So I think without having these big players involved, then it can never become really a mainstream thing because you need that supply um, of the actual assets coming on chain. Um, but with a, this is with a big caveat, right? Because these, um, these big institutions come with a lot of clout and they screwed us last time and we want to make sure that it's done in the right way, that is fair and accessible to everybody and it's here to do the right thing. So... <laughs> uh oh, you've you showed it, you've showed it. Yeah. It's screwed the right way. <laughs> um, yeah, and then the second part of the question, what was it again? How's it going to change us? How's it going to change blockchain culture? Uh, yeah. Given that we're no longer outside. Uh, I think obviously people are starting to pick up the ears now that it's in mainstream media, so that's going to be interesting. Like, I don't think it's going to happen overnight, but I think more and more different people will start to come into the space. Um, whether that means that we lose our kind of core values as, uh, as uh, I don't know, DJs, let's see. Um, but I hope not. I think it would just mean a, a hopefully a more diverse set of people coming into the space and getting interested. And, and I will say, there is nothing so degenerate as Wall Street. Like, I mean, you know, they invented this stuff. 1920s, you know, the, there was no technology to assist them in this stuff. And they had the most degenerate markets that have ever existed. So I, I kind of feel like all this blockchain is in many ways passing a slightly higher standard of integrity. Because if you let Wall Street off the leash, you know, we know where that goes. Uh, all right, who's next for the football? Mike, I'll take it. So, um... I think in hindsight, it was inevitable. I mean, when, when the transition happened and when everyone was getting excited about ETX and you know, all, the, all, the, all the parties and all the clubs and now finally one was in the flow and then there's something that they're sucking up all of our hard earned hodling for the last uh, 10 years. But I think it is in, in hindsight inevitable. And it's when I first visited Zug and we started our um, company there, it was interesting to see the original bankers just changing ties and becoming crypto bankers. I mean, they made that transaction very quickly, and I think BlackRock has basically led the charge in making it uh, mainstream. So I think we can't gripe about it too much. We just have to accept that that is, in a way, an adoption of old technology for good. Um, and so how are we going to be, um, how are we going to change our 
the way we interact with insiders, I think there's still innovation, I think there's still a drive, I think there's a passion for doing um, very interesting things. Now within a more a respectable, um, uh, 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 it, um, uh, way that we conduct ourselves, you know, people are without that edge maybe, but it's now mainstream and therefore you can actually say, actually I work in blockchain without having to really justify yourself down the path. It's a little more confidence in our set. Um, <clears throat> I'll keep it really short because uh, Francesco always has pals yeah, with us. So, uh, so, so, I'm going to be a little bit more blunt. I mean, we all sat here two years ago and said, you know, we can't wait for mainstream adoption because it's all going to benefit or so. Yeah. So, you know, these are the biggest companies and financial institutions in the world. It is, they, of course, they're going to get involved. So, I think, you know, that's, that's, that's really important. Um, one thing that has happened is the we've made the technology and hopefully we've put enough safeguards in there to keep it inclusive so everyone has an opportunity, but these the, the big ones are always going to come in bigger, that's just the nature of the pond. Um, what was the second question? Oh, uh, so the second question was how's it going to change us? How's it going to change us? Uh, in 10 years time we're going to be sat here and uh, there'll be a group on the stage that talking about the benefits of centralization will be disrupted. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we should really do a comedy thing where we get somebody from BlackRock to come and everybody turns up that day in suits. <laughs> really fine. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's sort of like, uh, yeah, I think it's positive building awareness in the space is extremely positive. I think we need to be careful also which instrument do we, we, we want to build and, uh, you know, which kind of like uh, frameworks and how we activate much more the community, right? Um, and I think that's the same concept for both builders and users. We want to give more instruments to have much more, uh, let's say, um, data points for making like uh, inform, infor informative decisions, right? And then builders to really enable the innovation that they want. So that's the only way that we scale, and I think bring awareness is extremely positive for, for anything. And we see that on different levels from like, you know, ad drops for farmers, like so many different things. And in terms of cultural change inside of the space, how do you think the players, the big finance guys, is going to change the way that we look at ourselves? I think I think there would be, as, as mentioned before, there would be much more personalized journeys. Uh, people that have different interests will go on different uh, ways. I think the most important part is that we need to uh, be able to activate and, and um, how we say, um, amplify those interests by different, like uh, you know, products and categories. So you will not have one one kind of winner for all, and uh, different like uh, feature and different us will be satisfied on different levels. Makes sense. Okay, should we do Q and A? Yeah. Fantastic, guys. Thank you very much. That was a great panel. You're part of the Q and A. Guys, anyone have any questions? Hi there. Um, what do you think the UK is doing specifically to help the uh, scalability of uh, real-world asset taking your... Anybody want to take that? I, I, can, I can take that if you like. So, the, the key enabling legislation is the uh, uh, UK Electronic Trade Documentation Act, which finally makes it possible to do things like electronic bills of lading. And that, uh, the UK government says opens up uh, over $200 billion of efficiency savings a year, uh, basically by making it possible to shift to sea containers around the world as NFTs, which I think is completely amazing. Um, and before that, there was also the UK Jurisdiction Task Force Digital District Resolution Rules a couple of years ago, which my colleague Anton worked very closely on. Anton, a few folks away. Don't know about the UK J2 rules, ask Anton. Um, and I think those two things together are huge enablers. Uh, past that, I don't know what else is going on. Thank God I am for that one. Yeah. Serious business. Serious business. He's a very smart guy. I think there's a bank of England sandbox, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, I always hear sandbox, and um, I think like sound pit, yeah. sound trap, like <laughs> sound. <laughs> very few things ever come out of sandbox. <laughs> I was all yeah, afraid of something. Got into the sandbox. Right, hope to see you again soon. Any other questions? Thank you. Actually, the Bitcoin network first BP. Back in the days, everyone can run, you know, mine Bitcoin on the computers, and that was before the BP or COVID. 
I was involved in mining and we were trying to sell computing powers, organize it, sell it. That's actually a WA, right? So we are already there for everyone, but everybody coined those two terms. Now, back in the days, and people were saying, oh, so much mining powers are concentrated in China. That's a, it's not decentralized. It's a centralized. It's no good. Now, the Chinese ban the mining sectors, everybody moved to the U.S. Now, they say, oh, it's safe because it's the U.S. Look, all the big miners, the U.S., are even more concentrated, right? So they are not tokenized as the, the computing power. They are actually listing on the stock exchange. Right? So they're going backwards. I just don't know how the industry is thinking this is a danger. This is really a danger to our uh, America. You know, all the big miners in the US are listing companies. The US, they green light ETFs because they know they can control it. They don't like Ethereum because they haven't been able to control it. They will control it when they classify as security. Yeah. Yeah. So the whole plot is against us. Don't think the black rock guys are our friends, okay. right? Yeah. This is very so you guys need to be thinking clearly. You know, we're going to go back to our roots. We're anti those guys, right? We're not, we're not friends. Thank you. Thank you. Adam, about minimal te technologies, so if all edge devices are validators, as I know validators need to have need to have access to full blockchain state, how do you keep how do you give validators which are edge devices actually access to full blockchain state? How how is the blockchain so small? Yes, so the the concept of minimum was basically to distribute and allow every node to construct and validate its own transaction. So it basically means that each node just does the work to process its own information, and all other nodes does the same. It adds up to a huge amount of computing power, but just distributed across the network. And so the the, um, the state of, the, of each node, when it processes a block randomly, may um, process the, um, the end of the block, but it just contributes to um, the computing power to transfer. Uh, for its own transactions. Um, and so it sees the current state of the network, and when the, a block is full, then um, the last uh, node just simply sends the hash of that um, state. So everyone sees it at the same time. Thanks, Adam. Any, any other questions? Hey, I just wanted to understand on the economics of decentralized compute. So, can it compute, uh, compete with centralized compute in terms of price point, probably, in the future? Uh, yes. Um, so, the price on our platform at the moment is about 80 to 90 percent less than the hyperscalers. Um, now, that is for a few things. Um, one, the hyperscalers mark up the market with an incredible amount. Right. So, we've come from the cloud space before. And that space was being heavily, heavily disrupted, and everyone was losing market shares in the hyperscalers. The hyperscalers took control of the market, much the same way you said with the, with the kind of you know the big miners um, as well. And uh, and then we've seen what what's happened with that. So yes, there's, there's, there is there are high margins within the hyperscalers, but it's also because we can start to use different types of facilities. So a lot of the suppliers on our network, believe it or not, have come from the Bitcoin mining space because now they want to get into uh, the, the AI space because it's less volatile uh, without the market cycles within there. So they're really good at running operations. Um, you know, we are only focused on the ones that, could, that have renewable energy, 100% renewable energy. So that comes with its benefits of lower cost electricity as well. They're often in more remote areas, so lower land costs, et cetera, et cetera. But they don't know how to sell cloud. So they want to run the operation, they want to put the machines there. Um, but they need a route to market, so that's kind of where we come in. So there's a, you know, we're not the only marketplace out there either. You know, just to keep it open, there are there are others out there, and the benefits across our kind of tiering is all very very similar, kind of between 70 and 90 percent less. Uh, and when you start using, you know, something like Minima, you know, which is right at the consumer edge for different types of workplace, 
I would imagine the segments are incredible, you know, there as well. Um, hi, uh, I actually have a question about um, art. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Uh, can I learn more from you, like about the valuation of the art tools? Like, if nowadays a creator they use the AI to help um, finish the art piece, like um, from my understanding uh, through the fellow artists, like they said, oh, if I make an art piece. Uh, like over thirty percent, like I change it through the AI piece, like more than thirty percent, then I own that, uh, like credit or copyright of that. Is that is that correct? And like, how would that affect the valuation? And could I ask one more question? Like this is um about like for the real world, like. Art paintings, for example, you mentioned like Picasso. They, in the past, I heard something like they scanned it and used the cracks. Like they help to, uh, there's software to, uh, like recognize the cracks and then like write it into smart contracts. Like, can I learn more from you? Like nowadays, what it, what it is like to do? Yeah, yeah, Thanks. Sure. So, first question around how do we value art and this aspect of AI and ownership and can you say that an artist has created the art if AI is involved? First of all, art is um, as valuable as, let's say, two people are willing to pay for it, right? Because at the end of the day, if two people want a piece of art and one person wants it more than the other, then it's going to sell for a certain price. So I don't think it matters so much about the AI component, actually. Um, I think, actually, Christie's was the first auction house to ever sell like a fully AI uh, generated art, and I can't remember the exact price off the top of my head, but an awful lot of money at that point in time. So I think it just really depends, like where the concept came from. A lot of it is around, you know, like how it's it's actually marketed in a sense, and and what it means, and then what the context is. So I think that's quite a difficult question to answer, and and it's such a um, subjective thing, valuing any piece of art, whether it's AI generated or not, is what I would say. Um, and then your second question was around, remind me, the cracks in the art. So um, this comes down to, I, I believe, the oracle solution in some senses, right? The oracle problem. So oracle problem is um, pinning data or about an asset um, onto the blockchain and making sure that it it is true, right? So it, in a physical art sense, um, how do we know that a physical piece of art can be pinned to a token or an NFT of some kind and that it's always reflected and that it is true, if you know what I mean. And I think you've drawn on a point here. So I, I do know a number of like startup um, companies who are working on this kind of technology, right? So there's one startup called ArtClear they've developed some kind of um, uh, very um, high-tech uh, like piece of machinery that basically you can zoom in on a, on a piece of art and you can it gives like a digital fingerprint of the canvas and the paint and the way it's reflected on the canvas and creates a unique digital fingerprint for that artwork so that you can then reflect it on the blockchain and know that this artwork has not been swapped out or faked in any way um, and it's, I think the first use cases are around shipping actually in the art industry because, um, you know, let's say a museum wants to loan a piece of art to a another museum on the other side of the world and this artwork has to be shipped there. How do you know that it wasn't like tampered with on the way or faked and swapped with a fake artwork? This technology can actually determine whether it's the same exact piece of art that was shipped from London to Hong Kong, let's say. So I think there's a few things being developed around that, but there's a, there's a hardware element to it always. Um, and that's kind of um, the blocker, I guess, in terms of scalability. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hopefully that answers some of your question. Thanks, Katie. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, two questions, please. Uh, firstly, what does H mean? I think people said H devices. So what, what does H mean? And second question, we've talked quite a bit about RWA, D-PIN, could, 
could please have some examples of your favorite deep in project as a as an inspiration for us or an illustration. Yeah. Right. Okay, edge. So basically that is is anything that is sitting independently um, contributing to a network. So it is a device, if you like, sitting um, where you have a part to play in the, in the large organization. So an, ed an edge computer or an edge device is something where you physically have a bit of work that's happening um, either in your hand or at the, edge of, at the edge of the network. It literally means you contribute to the larger part of the network. Um, um, deep in, so we are um, working with a lot of quite interesting projects, um, and um, Helium, I think, was one of the first sort of tailblazers for people who realized that you could um, distribute wireless and uh, Wi Fi and 5G, and people buying hardware, and then they were um, being able to um, distribute it and send it to others, and people paid them a small token. So we are working now with a number of companies. Um, helping to distribute uh, internet connectivity. Um, one a major player in Africa and another player in South America. And what's so um, compelling about this is that they've been providing Wi-Fi connectivity to really, really poor parts of um, either the rural Africa or Chanta towns in um, South America. And they've been giving people the ability to learn, to earn, to educate themselves. And the, they could actually quantifiably measure the economic benefit that was provided to that shantan just by internet connectivity. Um, and one of the projects, Wayru, had been given a, a billion gigabytes of data to distribute in their projects, and they said that they can that, that they can actually quantifiably prove that there's huge economic and, and social benefit from this connectivity. So these are that's a that's a very uh, compelling and good cause. I think. Oh, well, it, don't steal it from my mouth, I was just about to say that. Did anybody hear that? No? Okay. <laughs> um, I think Adam gave a pretty comprehensive answer, so I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, Helium is a really good example. World Mobile, one of their advisors up there, so you want to know more about that. It's a, a deep in telco network uh, working in Africa. And completely unbiased, my favourite is probably Kudos, so uh, <laughs> uh, anyone wants to know more, come see me afterwards. And you know, deep end doesn't have to be high tech. So, uh, I worked on a project once with 90,000 small solar lights into refugee camps in Pakistan. And the lights themselves were about the size of a saucer. A couple of solar panels on one side, batteries in the middle, and then some LEDs on the other side. And lights very much like that are sold all over Africa and gas stations now, in the sort of tens of millions of quantities. And people buy them instead of buying kerosene for kerosene money. That's a really simple example of deep in, but it, it's absolutely revolutionized Africa. It's amazing how big the savings are for going to solve over in kind of oil product in that context. Right. No? All right, well, thank you very much, everyone. So thank you for our panel. And now we've got a few minutes. Can we do a 10 minute summary and sort of give us an outro here? So, um, what, I, uh, what I thought we were talking about is it's almost 10 years since Ethereum. Right? This is, we're heading for the 10 year anniversary, and that has been the kind of great creative power that really took us into this age. Right? So, I wanted to talk a little bit about the original vision for Ethereum and how much all of this kind of RWA deep end stuff is completely the original vision. So, in 2015, the foundation released a video, which I would recommend everybody goes, you know, find out on YouTube, watch it, called Ethereum, the world computer. Lots of people have used that term since then, but it was invented by Gavin Wood of Ethereum Foundation, who then went on to parity, and the Ethereum world computer video is remarkable because it tells you what the foundation thinks Ethereum is for. And what it shows is a hospital, it shows a power station, it shows a forest, it shows shopping carts, it shows planes, it's all hardware, it's all physical assets. So I remember from those days, I was with the Foundation 2014, 2015, that everybody assumed that the natural thing to do with the blockchain was to do physical stuff on it. 
right? Real estate was sort of the use case that everybody was sort of interested in, excited about one day it would become possible to do this, when is that going to be? Um, similarly, all the things about gold, there were crypto projects that produced gold backed tokens going back to 2000, maybe 1990. Yeah, e gold and digital. Physical gold in vaults uses backing to issue tokens. And I'm literally in tokens, so this is like totally in digital cash. Pre decentralization, but still crypto tokens. So there has been a huge trajectory away from the real world in the middle period, right? We do this kind of crazy fear. I remember like looking at crypto kitties, and you know, all these kind of Ethereum emojis at that point were well, looking at these things like, that's amazing. I never thought that. I never thought anybody could do that. That's crazy. That's like a whole new thing. And you know, we watched that come totally from the left field and just explode all over the space. Similarly, you know, the 2018 ICO explosion, there had been an assumption that you were going to see equity crowdfunding using Ethereum. Right? The notion that you would do the crowdfunding without the equity and you were just going to YOLO the legals was totally unthinkable. Right? So what happened is basically this. It turns out to be much harder than anybody expected to do real world assets. And it turned out to be much harder than anybody expected to get through the legal hurdles to things like energy crowdfunding. That stuff turned out to be much slower and much more difficult than anybody expected. It's only really in the last two years that we've seen that stuff standing up properly. And we still are in a regulatory void in America. I think Europe is going to sort itself out. I'll talk to that in a second. So, we're now back in more or less the position that we started in, which is the hot narrative in the blockchain is real world assets. Um, we're finally talking about institutional adoption. Was anybody around like 14, 15, 16? Anybody that far back one or two? Remember everybody used to talk about, you know, we're going to go talk to the banks and the banks are going to be adopting the blockchain and it's going to change everything. It's the future of finance. Right? And that was the big narrative, 15, 16, 17. Everybody went to talk to banks, the banks were doing all kinds of little prototypes and tests and pilot projects and all the rest of that stuff. And then there was a long gap, long gap. Nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened. NFTs exploded, DeFi exploded, ICOs exploded, and I literally they exploded. And then suddenly here we are kind of back to the future, like, oh, wow. Big financial institutions are going to do real world stuff in the blockchain, and the hot narrative is what we're going to do about real estate. Right? I mean, you know, when I'm talking to people about material, I always say, why is there no global electronic exchange for real estate, which is the world's largest asset class? And everybody stares at me like, oh, I can't. Sucks and bombs. Right? Traded on paper through right up until the early 1980s. The process for closing a deal to buy shares looks almost exactly like the process for closing on a house deal. This stuff is a massive, massive manual paper grind. Then we went digital. Now you could even think of buying and selling stocks using a manual system. Why are we still doing real estate? So this feeling that we're finally kind of back where we expected to be, we thought it was going to be two or three years left to get to this point instead of 10. I would like to suggest that this RWA narrative is not, in fact, a new narrative. It's simply a restoration of the original vision for Ethereum, and therefore for the things which are like Ethereum. We're back where we started. The banks have finally come to the table. Real world assets are possible. Let's get everything sorted out and do this. Um, and that's a kind of strange thing, because everybody new to the space thinks RWA is new, and everybody that's been in the space for years is like, oh, we're finally doing it. <laughs> and that's where I think right? I started material in 2017 to solve this. So that notion that it's taken that long to get the wheel to turn to the point where all this is possible, I think that's really important. The other thing I want to talk about is relationship with government. So the Americans are staggeringly hostile to crypto. The Americans have always been hostile to crypto. The crypto war started in the 1990s. 1990s, I was there for that. Um, the American government declared encrypting your email to require technology of normally only be sold to the militaries, and they made it illegal to export crypto from America. And a whole bunch of people threw in their American passports and left. This was the 1990s crypto wars, focusing on a thing called ITAR. ITAR is the thing that classifies things as munitions. 
Um, E-Gold, as currently I mentioned, the gold tokens, that was 2000. I think they started maybe 97. Bay, there was another global digital currency called Beans, who used to be the CEO of that time, which still do. So there was a huge wave of this kind of digital currency activism then, but it wasn't decentralized because we didn't have the algorithms to make it decentralized. We didn't have the computer science to make decentralization. So those projects got pulled one by one. Eagle got sandbagged by the American government in 2005, and that marked the end of that phase of the critical wars. The government won again. And then a couple of years after that, Bitcoin appears probably as the revenge. You know, like, well, we were doing it that way, and it didn't work, well, now we're going to do it this way. So, right? And so they spin up Bitcoin, and then all this stuff comes out. This is the third wave of the program. So the idea that the American government is just going to roll over on this stuff and let it just be very unlikely. It's probably going to be very contested. Where it's not going to be very contested is the EU. Right? The EU has a huge slab of regulation called MICA, uh, MICA as the Europeans will say, in markets in crypto assets. It's a huge slab of legislation which basically establishes completely clear, clear rules for crypto in all major use cases applicable over the entire world. Right? And that changes everything. That starts coming into force over the next year or so. And that is going to produce the world's largest economy a sensible rule-based order on crypto. Now, not everybody is going to like all of those rules, not everybody is going to approve of all of those rules, but once the world's largest economy lays out what those rules are, people will figure out how to play by those rules, and that will probably be prime zero for crypto adoption. Right? Chinese government is rolling out crypto all the way through the Belt and Road supply chain stuff, the expectation is that that stuff is going to wind up a digital yuan on some kind of national blockchain. And that will be how China manages the kind of logistics and the paperwork around one belt, one road. That's a huge continental sized integration. And um, finally, we have the British play. Uh, and this is where I will wind up. So the British play is basically a response to Brexit. And the response to Brexit has been overall really shambolic and disorganized. And the whole thing is looking a bit like a farce. But that's usually how stuff looks in Britain until everybody puts their heads together and figures out how to make it work. Most really big innovations in British culture start with the farce. As we go out with the farce, what you get is things like the UK Electronic Trade Documentation Act that makes it possible to take all the documentation for global trade, all that container shipping stuff, and put that stuff on chain. And this is game changing, right? This really, really helps everything work the way that it ought to work. Right. Likewise, all the stuff from the UK courts, very, very, very powerful, very direct, sorts out everything. This is all the stuff from the UK uh, digital, uh, jurisdiction task force and the digital district resolution rules. So what you're going to see is that the UK government, I want to recommend reading the speech by Sir Jeffrey Voss on the launch of the, Euro, the digital district re resolution rules, where he basically says, look, the UK government already acts as the core venue for half a trillion dollars of electronic derivatives trading, why shouldn't the UK be the jurisdiction where the world settles all its blockchain disputes? We're acting in support of that measure, here you go. So I think that what you're going to get in two years is a common acceptance that the governments have finally sorted out their figures, they've come to the table with rules, they're actively encouraging blockchain adoption as technological competition between the European, the American and the Chinese bloc. And the, European, and the rest of the world is attempting to clear its transactions through the UK. So as the UK blockchain community, I want to stress to everybody, look internationally, look at the Commonwealth, look around the world at the places where people want to do these transactions and visualize Britain as the hub for everybody that isn't either EU, China or America that does their transactions, because that's half of the world. It's going to be good years. Amazing, Vinay. Thank you so much. And a big round of applause for our panelists as well. Thank you guys all so much. And that's it for us. We've got food and drinks here, like proper food. Also, guys, we always ask you to do a survey if you can. And time we have swag to give you if you complete the survey. There's hoodies, there's shirts, there's bags, there's flip flops, all the things. So if you guys find Arkin, Arkin, can you give a wave? Uh, and Zara. Hello. And do the survey, we'll help you guys out. All right, thank you guys all again. Thank you. <laughs>
from yes. going to the survey? Yes. How? How? On your laptop, yes? If no, you just go ahead and QR code. Yes, yes. I, I definitely need more goodies. Yes. The <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.